you stand with us? So great to see you. I'm excited to worship this afternoon. I wanted to read from Psalm 100. In verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Verse 2, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. I want us to do that from the beginning of this session. Why don't we just lift our hands all over this place? We've got so many things to be grateful for. As the Word says, let's come into His presence with singing. So all all across this room right now, begin just to lift your voice to the Lord. Just begin to lift up your song of praise, a song of love to the Lord. Just for a moment as the music begins to swell and to build, as it begins to fill this room, fill this room with the praise of God. Right now, God, we step into your presence. We enter your courts with thanksgiving and praise. We love you, Lord. We give you honor. We give you glory. Let's sing. Come on, let's lift our voices to the King of Kings. He's so worthy, worthy of the highest praise. So we give it to you right now, Jesus. Oh, the high.
face makes a difference Cause his name makes a difference And our praise makes a difference So we'll praise you Our praise makes a difference Cause his name makes a difference And our praise makes a difference So we'll praise you And our praise makes a difference Your name makes a difference Praise makes a difference, so I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you, Lord. Say that to the Lord right now. I'll praise you, Lord. Jesus. I'll praise you, Lord. I'll praise you.
Let it 
we just receive your reign. We receive your reign over our churches, over our cities, Lord, over our families, Lord. We receive, we need your reign, Lord. We receive your reign right now. Come wash over us again. Wash over us afresh. Holy Spirit, pray you just increase your presence all over this room right now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you're so welcome here. We need your reign, Holy Spirit. We need your reign. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you.
pray that right now. We are yours for the taking, Lord. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we stand in your presence right now. God, so thankful, so reminded of what you've done. Lord, we just come again. We say we are yours for the taking. Everything that we have, everything that we own, every crown that we have, we just give it to you, Lord. It's yours for the taking. Lord, we thank you for this time. What a joy and what an honor it is to be in your presence. Lord, we love you, Lord. We give you the highest praise as we started out this time singing. We give you the highest praise. Lord, we give that back to you, Lord, right now. The highest praise to the highest name. Jesus, we love you. We give you the honor and the praise and the glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I knew I loved Jesus a lot, but I knew I was lacking a lot of foundations that I really wanted to take the time to build. And I felt like the Lord was telling me to take a year, build the foundations, um, and just be solid in my faith before going out into the rest of my life, whatever he calls me to do. Now that I have gained all these new tools and skills over the course of the year, I can now take that back to campus and pioneer something new. The Radiant School Worship is a spirit-filled, transforming, and transformational program. It equipped me to get ready and prepare myself to prophesy, to lean into the Lord, and actually seek and depend on the Lord and hear heavily His voice. If you're thinking about coming to the RSW program, just do it, pray about it, and apply. I can 100% guarantee you it'll be a chapter of your life you'll never forget. Give it up for RSM and RSW. <clears throat> so you may or may not be aware, but uh, we have two programs, and uh, we kicked off Radiant School of Ministry this last year uh, in September, which is a great time to start schools of ministry uh, in the middle of a pandemic, but we really felt like God had called us. He said, I gave you the timing, I gave you the mandate, just obey, and we did it, and we have uh, our first class, both part-time and full-time, has been an incredible year uh, of those who are pursuing, number one, the first year of program is just, I'm following through on a commitment to give God a year of my life, and uh, let him shape my identity, let him speak to me about purpose, let me build foundations of biblical uh, truth, so that when I step out into the world and maybe I go to secular university next year, I have a biblical foundation that I'm able to face the onslaught of a worldview that looks different than what I believe. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So I believe deeply in the vision of RSM, uh, Radiant School of Ministry. And here's what I would encourage you, uh, whether it's you or people that are from your church, Give God one year. Just give God one year before you go and do anything else. Give God one year and marinate yourself in, a, in the presence of God, in the word of God, serving the people of God, and watch what God will do, how he will shape you, change you, and prepare you. And then come back for year two if you feel called into vocational ministry. If you don't, go to the trade school or the university, wherever God's calling you to go, but go prepared. And then RSW, Radiant School of Worship, is the same way. Our students are, come on, give it up for the Radiant School of Worship students. They're the, they're the vocal ones. And uh, they are uh, such a gift, not only to our church, but to so many, because they lead a lot in our prayer meetings. We have morning, noon, and night prayer, Monday through Friday, and they're leading a lot. They're learning uh, about the presence of God. They're learning leadership. They're learning skill. And so if you have people in your church that you want to grow in the arena of worship, worship leading, musicians, production, uh, check out RSW. So if you want information on both of those, they're available out in the lobby and we can get you uh, connected with all the, all the right people. So we'd love for you to take advantage of that. Second thing is we wanna let you know that tonight uh, we're gonna have a night of worship and prophetic ministry. Upper Room is gonna be leading us in worship tonight. And so... We're very excited about that. I want everybody, though, to make sure you're going to want to be here no later than 645. And here's why. Because at 645, 
I am going to introduce a friend of mine to you who's going to take about 10, 15 minutes, and he's going to show you and demonstrate and answer a few questions about a tool that has changed the game of studying for me, and that's Logos. Uh, how many of you use Logos Bible software? Anybody in the, in the room? How many have ever heard of it? You don't use it yet. Listen, uh, Logos 9 just came out. And uh, my good friend, Scott Lindsay, who is, he's the Michael Jordan of Logos. I mean, this guy, he, he helps uh, everybody that you read their books from, from John and Lisa Brevere, Christine Kane, uh, to Lee Cummings. This guy helps uh, figure out how to study the Bible more effectively. And he's become a good friend. We asked him specifically to come here. He doesn't normally do conferences. He sends other people to do that, but he's here and the reason why I'm so passionate about Logos is not just because it's a software, but it's the fruit that can come out of that. If we're going to teach the Word of God in this culture, we need every advantage that we can have. And having the right skill set. I love books. I'm a physical books guy. But being able to take Logos with me and to know how to use it and maximize it, I can take what would take me about 40 hours and I can do it in 20 minutes. And uh, he's going to come up on the stage and he's going to take 15 uh, minutes and he's going to share logos. He, we, he has logos nine with him, which just came out. And here's, here's the deal. Here's why you're going to want to be here for that. Cause I, I can see some of you are like, well, I'll just go to dinner and maybe I'll pick up. No, you're going to want to be here. Here's why. Because if you are in person here, if you registered for the conference, your name without you knowing went into a drawing. And tonight, if you are in the room, only if you are in the room, uh, he is going to be giving away a brand new uh, iPad, uh, the newest edition that is loaded with the, the nice keyboard and the mag pencil and the whole thing and Logos 9 on thumb drive for that. It's going to one person, you have to be in the room to get it. So he's going to draw it and uh, and. You're gonna want, you're, you do not want to find yourself at Qdoba like, oh, rah, rah, rah. oh, they just called my name? Oh, I could have just, it's like, this is a mega gift. So you're gonna to want to be here for that. 6.45, and then we're gonna go from 6.45 to 7, he'll share. And then at 7, we're gonna go right into worship. And we're just gonna have a powerful time tonight. Wasn't worship incredible, even in the middle of an afternoon session? Thank you, Richard and Sarah. We just love them. If you don't know who that couple was, they have been a gift to our church. They lead at our Portage campus, and uh, they are incredible. Sometimes they lead here, and we just love them, love them to death. So, hey, in this session, I want to introduce to you a, a friend, a very close friend. Some of you know him. If you're from here, you know him. Some of you know him from other places. Wayne Drain is a man that I was introduced to uh, I don't know, less than 10 years ago, uh, one of our overseers, Tom Lane, kept talking about this guy named Wayne Drain. I'm like, with a name like that, he's got to be really good at basketball. I mean, uh, drain, drain it. And, and I heard his name everywhere I was, I was going. And about that time, about 10 years ago, Tom Lane pulled me into doing prophetic ministry. Now, for a long time, I knew that God had given me a prophetic gifting. I just didn't know in what context to utilize that. Tom Lane began to invite me to do prophetic presbyteries at church where we minister to people prophetically. And I, I heard that one of the godfathers of prophetic ministry was this guy named Wayne Drain. And I met him and we did our first presbytery together in um, Fort Myers, Florida. And when I met him, I was like, this is one of the coolest people I have ever met. He has since become a dear friend. He is also a mentor uh, to me in all things prophetic. He's got an incredible testimony. You're going to love him. So would you put your hands together and welcome to the platform, Wayne Drain. Come on up here, Wayne. Welcome, Wayne. Ooh, this is a deep chair. Wow. Hold on. I'm going to put my booster seat so I can... I don't even know if that works. Wow. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. you no, know, always... like I'm really glad you're here <laughs> because otherwise I'd be speaking this session right now without Jackie being here. But uh, obviously God knew what he was doing and uh, you were so gracious to come and uh, minister a workshop, which I heard was just packed uh, on the prophetic, on the prophetic ministry. And we're honored to have you here. 
uh, you've become such a dear friend to Jane and I uh, and our church. We just love you. You're, you're uh, one, of the, one of the most fatherly men in the body of Christ that I have ever met. And uh, I just want to say we're so grateful for you and uh, you. grateful for your voice in this house and in our lives. So thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, Pastor Wayne, uh, I call you Pastor Wayne because for 45 years, you were a pastor. Maybe just start by telling everybody your testimony about how you came to the Lord, when that was, and the journey that God took you on over that 45-year period of time. Well, I became a, a Christian in high school, and then uh, when I went to university, um, something marvelous happened. Uh, what's called the Jesus Movement rolled across our campus. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I found myself at 20 being newly married and being the leader of several hundred um, hippies. And, uh, and that's like, that's worse than herd musicians, I'm telling you. And so they, and so we, we didn't know what was happening. We just knew that the Lord was up to something great. And, and it was a, uh, uh, it was a magical time, if I can use that term, because it was something beyond us. Uh, we saw miracles. We saw healing. Uh, we were just naive enough to believe that maybe we could do what was in the Bible. So we, we, we coined a few phrases that we would read the red and pray for the power. So we, we read the red letters in the Gospels, what Jesus did on earth. And then we prayed for the power that we saw mentioned in Acts with his disciples, what they did after Jesus was taken up into heaven. So the, uh, a church grew out of that. Uh, we had about a third of, our, a third of our, that group were music majors. So music was a real strong component. Worship became a strong component, songwriting. And it opened up lots of doors. And we started... We started uh, running with people uh, like Paul Clark, Phil Keggy, Second Chapter of Acts, Keith Green, people like that. And, and back then it wasn't about the music ministry. It was just about uh, people that fell in love with Jesus. With a song that we sang, I'm a fool for Jesus, whose fool are you? And that was sort of our attitude. And, and we, saw, we saw hundreds of kids delivered from drugs, a demonic possession. And we thought it was just normal but the last thing I wanted to be was a pastor. I grew up in a church with a tent revivalists, and I knew that wasn't the life that I wanted. And so I was a business major, and the Lord just kept pressing me and sending prophets toward me saying, you're going to pastor a church, and you're going to prophesy to nations. So after hearing that word from several people from different nations that didn't know each other using the same phrases, it took me a while to quit looking for God to send us someone to pastor the church when he asked me to do it. So uh, my wife and I uh, founded that church. Well, we didn't found it. Jesus found it, a bunch of friends. We just, we just called it what we saw it being. It was a church like we saw in Acts. That's what we wanted. So we pastored that church for 45 years. Um, and the church became, uh, it became a, a mirror of what God had called me to be. We had a strong local church that was very given to relationship and to uh, uh, not ritual, not religion, but relationship, strong in worship. And then we started writing songs, and those songs started flying around different places and started going to nations. And so I got to prophesy to nations, and I've been to, uh, I think, 36 or 37 nations now. And, and those prophetic words I got as a 20-year-old have just played out. And so uh, in 2017, the Lord spoke to me to turn the church over to someone else, a young guy named Chris, and he's doing a great job. And, but I said, well, Lord, what am I going to do? I'm not ready to retire. And he said, that's not in your playbook. Retirement is not in your playbook. He said, you've been faithful to pastor the church and to go out when you could, but now I want to send you uh, uh, to the nations again. And I want to send you to places across the United States. And I said, well, Lord, what do you want me to say? And he said, I want you to go and say a second Jesus movement is coming. I want you to go and proclaim that it's going to be an awakening, not just a revival. It's going to impact the culture and not just a weekend uh, or not just a week of revival meetings. So since 2017, I've been going from place to place and to different nations until COVID sort of shut things down. 
And uh, that's what I've been doing. I've been, I've been uh, having the opportunity to meet people like Lee and Jane and love them and encourage them. I want to tell you as a pastor, I can tell you that pastors and pastors' wives or, or pastors and pastors' husbands, uh, they need encouragement. They get, a lot, they get probably enough criticism without yours. Uh, they, they need some encouragement, so that's what I do. And then uh, when I get an opportunity, I just uh, I tell people, Second Jesus Movement is coming. You can be a part of it if you'll just lean in and not run away and not wait on someone else to do it. Like I kept waiting for someone else to be a pastor for about five years, and I finally gave in and said, well, I guess... I'm the best that Jesus had to work with, maybe. So, so I've been, I, I loved what I did, and I was a little bit, uh, I grieved a little bit when I turned the church over because I loved it so much, but I didn't grieve because it was a mistake. I grieved because I wouldn't get to see those people as much. But I'm having a, a great time right now. It feels like recess. I get to go out and, and, and uh, play in the playground and do the stuff, and I'm, and I'm loving it, so... Thank you for serving the church for 45 years uh, as a pastor. That's amazing. That's, that's a rare thing. We've been here for 25 years, and I'm like, Lord, 20 more? Uh, that's 45 years. That's an, awesome, that's an awesome example of longevity and faithfulness. Uh, you mentioned that you were saved in the midst of the Jesus revival, the Jesus movement. There are a lot of people that may have only heard little bits and pieces of it. A lot of people may not be familiar with it. Kind of explain kind of the time frame and who that impacted and how it impacted our culture. Well, it was in the late 60s. There was a lot of turmoil in the nation. Uh, Vietnam War had happened. Uh, uh, President Kennedy had been assassinated. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. Uh, there was just a lot of turmoil, a lot of rioting on campuses, uh, people even getting shot, students getting shot in Kent State. And so it was a very uh, uh, chaotic time. And uh, some music started coming out of the West Coast and some philosophy started coming out of, of tune in, turn on, and drop out. And people started dropping out of society and forming these little uh, communes. And, but it was all about Eastern religions. It was all about, it was all about um, drugs, sex, and rock and roll. That seemed to be the mantra of the time. But in the middle of it, out in California, a uh, uh, pastor got a call, and people said, there's about 300 hippies on your front door that want to talk to you. And so Chuck Smith went down, and, and he didn't want to go, but his wife made him, as our wives often do. And, and he... He went down and said, what, what is it? He said, well, we've been looking into religion. We, we decided we wanted to consider Christianity. So he told them the gospel. They started baptizing people in the Pacific Ocean. And there was, they, they reckoned by the time it started, now we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have the internet. We had uh, Volkswagen vans and we had this. And that's how we traveled. And uh, uh, as that started to spread across the nation, by the end of it, over 800,000 uh, young people gave their lives to Jesus. And it, sh it showed up on our campus in about 1971, 1972, and when I was uh, uh, just graduated high school and starting into college. And, and there was this little, uh, this little noontime prayer group uh, that was known as that weird group. And so it was people that were not just one group. It was like jocks and nerds and preps and fraternity guys and cowboys and all kinds of different groupings of people. But the commonality was there was this one guy with a 12-string guitar that had orange fluorescent letters, Jesus Power, on it. And he would go down there and just start playing these songs he'd heard on the radio, and he had changed the, the, the words to be about Jesus rather than a girl. And so I was a musician. I was in a band, and, and, uh, and, and June and I were uh, thinking about getting married, and we thought, well, what's going on? We both get filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and we start going to this little group. I remember walking in and thinking, I don't think I'm going to like anybody in here. I don't know what I'm doing here. And then... But they started playing that guitar, and the presence of God would fill that room on campus. And 
that little group of about 10, 15 people became 50 and 100 and 200 and 300, and it just kept growing, and we kept going to bigger rooms on campus. College professors started getting saved. Policemen started getting saved. Lawyers and doctors and and kids from all over town started coming. And so on Thursday nights, we had what we called a devotional. Basically, we would, we, would, we would sing and play songs until our fingers were bleeding, and then we would share a testimony. And the testimony was basically, I used to get high on drugs, now I get high on Jesus. That was about as deep as it got. And then we'd say, does anybody else want Jesus? And all these people would get saved. Then the TV trucks showed up one night in one of our devotionals there in Russellville, and, and it was announced on television and in the newspaper. There's a new Bible school in Arkansas. It's Arkansas Tech University, and they showed the clips of our service, and it was wild. Uh, and then kids started hitchhiking from the four corners of the state all the way up to, and they'd come in on Thursday nights. They would get saved, get filled with the Spirit, go back to high school or wherever they were, and they would start telling their friends about Jesus. So this, uh, this wave of the Spirit went across Arkansas. And then we started joining up with others like the musicians I mentioned in these outdoor festivals, and thousands of people would show up. And we would just sing till our fingers were bleeding, give a testimony. I used to get high on drugs, now I get high on Jesus. Does anybody want to get saved? And then all these hundreds of kids would come running to the Lord. And we thought that was normal. We just thought it was normal. And so it became normal for us. And um, um, it was not all easy. It was not all, um, uh, ministry is not all easy. I didn't feel called to ministry per se when the Lord made that clear. I gave myself to it. But this, this story that was happening on our campus was happening in Chicago and Portland and New York and, and Asbury College over in Kentucky and it's happening just all over these little pockets. And then there was Explo 72 at Cowboy, in, in Dallas. Uh, Billy Graham spoke and there was, a, there was a front cover of Life Magazine of that Jesus rally. And it just, it shot through the culture. Elton John sang Jesus Freaks in the Streets. And, and so suddenly it, it had just uh, it had blown up. Kids were getting saved everywhere. And it, was a, it, was, it wasn't called a revival, it was called a revolution because we were a counterculture to the counterculture. That's, that's huge. And I don't know if there's anything so, else so you want to know. question I've that. wanted to ask you because I know you were so involved in that. And we've talked about this a lot. But when you were in the middle of that, were you aware that this is a, a, an awakening or a revival? Was there like a sense of, oh, this, because I think sometimes when we think about revival or uh, great awakenings or renewals that happen, we have this, subvert, or this uh, subconscious mindset that they knew that they were in it. And I, I really wonder if sometimes we're in things that we don't know of until we're out of them and then look back on them. What was it like being in the middle of it? Did you kind of know something unique was happening? Well, the only grid, I, the only word I had that was familiar was revival, and what that meant was a week of meetings in the fall, like Neil Diamond sang about hot August night, that sort of thing. So I had that grid. So we called it revival, but we knew it was more because there wasn't the classic uh, preaching meetings. It was really organic. It was happening in dorms. It was in. It was happening downtown. It was happening in the country. It was happening in the city. Uh, and then I started realizing it was more, and so I started looking into revivals in history, and I studied the Great Awakenings, and I thought, I didn't know that had happened. I was not a student uh, of the Bible or a student of church history, and I thought, no, this is more than revival. Uh, this is some sort of movement, some sort of awakening that was not uh, initiated by, by man. What, what were some of the things that, as you look back on it, and the reason why I'm asking you a lot about it is not just to reminisce, but you've made the statement that you believe the Lord's commissioned you to declare to the church that a second Jesus revolution or movement is coming. And I believe that. You and I are, I mean, that's what I live and breathe for. So looking
<clears throat> okay, you do this to me every time. <laughs> so looking back on it, what were some of the distinctive marks or emphasis or things that you knew that God was breathing on then that maybe you are beginning to see emerge now in the body of Christ? Well, it was, uh, it was about knowing Jesus, not knowing about him. The central, the central issue of the Jesus movement was just Jesus. We called ourselves Jesus people We'd refer to ourselves as a Jesus man or a Jesus woman. And uh, we tried to keep it from becoming a ritual or a denomination. We wanted to keep it about Jesus. So we, we named our church Fellowship of Christians for that reason. And the other hallmarks were it was uh, uh, very evangelistic. It was about preaching the gospel. It was about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. God was asking us to do things that were beyond our abilities. So we read that he would endue us with power. And so people would ask, uh, did you get it? She got it. I heard my cousin got it. And that was about, it was about being baptized in the spirit. And we thought it was an experience. But as we went toward it, we realized it was a relationship. That the Holy Spirit would, uh, was the one called alongside to point us toward Jesus and uh, help us be witnesses and to help us live a holy life. So it was about the, preaching the gospel. It was about, uh, uh, it was about worship. We, we lost ourselves in worship. It was like our meetings would go on for two and three hours before the preaching would ever start and nobody got tired and nobody even went to the bathroom. It didn't seem. And, uh, we just could get enough. And then it was about the Bible. We fell in love with the Bible and we said it's not good enough to be told what we ought to believe. And we discovered this little tribe called the Bereans. We decided we wanted to be good Bereans so we would read and see what was going on. Um, it was mobile. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a part of the transformative process was that we all realized it was a commission to all of us. It wasn't just to a special few. So we would just go. We, we would meet in the middle of the week so our weekends could be free to go wherever God told us to go. So there was a going, um, and there was a fearlessness about it. There was just a, this fearlessness would rise up in you, and you just quit fearing the faces. You kept fearing the what ifs. And so instead of asking the questions why, we just thought, why not? Let's do this. So we, we saw lots of things happen. But I think the central focus was Jesus. And when he began to speak to me about a second Jesus move, and I had a dialogue with the Lord, and, and I said, Lord, I'll do that. But we've already had a Jesus movement. I said, you want to call it a second Jesus movement? He said, yep. He's... The Lord, you know. He said, yep. He said, yep. He was from, a, <laughs> he was identifying with my southernness, I think. And he, and he said, well, I kind of like the name. I like it too. And I said, I said, okay. I said, I'm there. But, but he told me it would not be a repeat. There would be, there'd be the same essence. It would be about Jesus. It would look different and smell different and all that stuff, but it would, but it would, it, it would not be exactly the same because we're not in the same time. And if anything, it would have to be more revolutionary. Hmm. So when you, uh, you travel a lot, yeah. and when you travel and you're in different places ministering, You've used the phrase uh, to me before that you can smell, that you go someplace and you'll, you'll say about it, I smell revival there. Yeah. Uh, explain what you mean by that. And as you're looking kind of across the, the panoramic view of the body of Christ in 21st century America, what are some of the, uh, I guess, what are some of the things that you're, what are you smelling? <laughs> well, I... You know, the prayers of the saints come up as a sweet aroma. 
And I don't know exactly what that aroma smells like. We have had times where we would just, our room would just smell like flowers. I mean, physical smell. But I think when I say I, I smell revival, it, it, when I find out that I've smelled revival in the city, there's always been a praying church, uh, a praying people there. And it's some kind of aroma that I just know in my knower uh, that there's, there's revival here. When I was flying into Kalamazoo uh, yesterday, uh, smooth flight all the way to Atlanta and Detroit, and then when I started from Detroit, just before I got into Kalamazoo, as I'm coming in, the plane was just doing all of this. And I mean, and it was, it was kind of a spooky thing. And, and, uh, and, but I always do this. I'll say, Lord, are you trying to say something? And he said, yeah. He said, this is what's happening above Kalamazoo. He said, there's great resistance, great wind resistance. The, the enemy is trying to push back the wind. Uh, but he said, just like you're going to land, awakening is going to land in this city. So I, the thing I would say to you guys about that is, is warfare is not for, uh, it's not for half-hearted people. And you are in a battle, but it's a good battle because we win. Amen. <laughs> I love that. I love that. When you, uh, when you look at the culture, and especially even 2020, the, you know, the year that we all went through together, which I think in many ways is going to mark a generation. Um, you know, I think prior to that, maybe 9-11 was a seminal moment in our nation that really became a tipping point for culture and shaped from, you know, 2001 till 2020. It shaped our worldview and it shaped really the culture of millennials and those that were coming up in the middle of it. And now I think 2020 is maybe even a greater uh, tipping point for culture. What does that feel like when you watched what all took place? You know, there was so much that took place. There was obviously the pandemic, but there was an election. Uh, there were protests in the streets, there was call for justice, there was riots, there was uh, violence, there, I mean, everything, there was an economic downturn, everything that could happen within a culture happened within 12 months. And it has shaped us, and I don't even think that we understand the PTSD collectively that everybody has experienced, but in the middle of that, I was thinking when you were talking about the Jesus movement coming out of the turmoil of the 60s, and it seems like the last year that we were in is like the 60s. Hey, we brought it out of the attic, and here you are, 1960s, 2020 version of it. Does it feel like the same conditions that are necessary to precipitate uh, a move of God are in place? Do you sense that, or do you feel like we've got a, a, a ways to go before we see those watershed moments, or is it going to kind of be regional, or what, what's it going to look like, do you think? I think, it ha I think it has to be soon. I'm not sure the world can last as it is. Uh, uh, I, th I think uh, fear has been a component and we have to break out of the fear. The Lord often speaks, he, his word, this sounds a little funny, but his word sometimes carries on the wind of music for me. And so the, uh, the music of the early Jesus movement uh, was just basically a way we were prophesying. And what I've noticed in the last, since 2017, I've noticed that our worship has kind of been a progression of where we've been. Uh, the millennials, when they started breaking in the scene, it was all about brokenness. And then it went to be in discovering that God is good. And now it's, oh God, send the rain. Oh, God, bring revival. Oh, God, bring awakening. So it's gone from a very personal, how do I get free, uh, to a, oh, God is good. And then, oh, Jesus, come and move. I'll go wherever you want. So I think I've watched that. I've listened to that in the songs. I've seen it uh, in the spirit. And I've, 
I just can't imagine as a father and as a grandfather, I can't imagine my kids coming to me and asking for something as many as are without me responding. So I, I sense God's, God's compassion for us. Uh, and I sense uh, his desire to come and move among us is greater than our desire for it. But we, we are in, uh, uh, a lot of folks are still sidelined because of fear. A lot of folks are, side, are, are siloed up in their homes. Mm -hmm. And I think God's calling us out. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, come on, mm -hmm. this is the time. Uh, and, I, and I, Lee, if it, I just can't see it not breaking out soon. The other night we had Sean Foyt in Little Rock and every, all the Christians were telling me, don't do it, don't do it. It's, people are gonna get upset because he, he's been sort of a firebrand if you watched him and, and people didn't always wear masks and things like that. And so folks said, don't do it. It'll, it'll hurt the church's reputation, all this. But the Lord spoke to me clearly to do it. And we have a group called Arkansas Awakening that we've been praying for four years. We bring them in and... Uh, uh, it was an amazing time. We were expecting a few hundred and a couple thousand showed up, which is big for Little Rock. And when he started to play, and I'd heard this before on videos, it was the first time I had heard that same and felt and smelled that same thing I felt in the first Jesus movement. And it wasn't just Sean Foy. It's, not, it's in some sense, it's not about him at all. But there's, there was this dynamic of the spirit there was an anticipation, there was a hunger, there was a joy, there was a, it's like the king had suddenly just rode in and everybody was celebrating. We baptized, I don't know how many people out there under, under the Little Rock Bridge. Uh, so, and I, I talk about smelling, I just, I smelt it there, you know, and it was so similar, uh, so many Memories and feelings floated up in me. I got this is just what it felt like back then. That's what smell is. Smell yeah. does. It's like yeah. you know you have a smell and like an old song that you've heard takes you back to a moment. Yeah. If you walk into some place and you smell something, you're just like, oh, that I remember. You know your mom's cooking. You haven't smelled it in a long time, and you walk in and you can pick it up, and it just takes you back. And so that's a great. It's a great picture of that. Um, the, the question I have is, so if, if and when revival or awakening, revolution, whichever phrase you want to use, begins to impact our culture in a way that the Jesus movement did, obviously it will look different. It will take on different characteristics, may have some of the same emphasis, but it'll look different. Uh, it will be communicated different. Music festivals were a big thing during the Jesus movement. Now we've got social media, and so things travel way quicker. Uh, it'll, it'll take on different uh, personality, but my question is, when it comes, how do you pastor it? Because you spent 45 years pastoring revival, and uh, sometimes I think as pastors, we ought to be careful what we pray for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you pray for revival, now you have to pastor. You have to pastor people in revival. You pray for prodigals to come home. What do you do when they come home? And in this culture, they look different uh, than the rest of the people who are the, you know, the 35% who want to go to church, who serve Jesus, love Jesus, call themselves a committed Christian. They come to church. What happens if there's a 5 to 10% shift in our culture? and people that are coming from different backgrounds, different religions, you know, out of Islam or out of atheism, out of the LGBTQ community, out of the trans community, they're coming into the church hungry for Jesus. Now we have to pastor those people. It's not just enough to say, hey, you're here, great, and we baptize you, now figure it all out on your own. I'd love for you to talk about what it was like and some of the ups and the downs of what it was like pastoring in the middle of revival. Well, the pastoring part is about loving people. It's about correcting people. It's about singing the old songs. You know, it's about it, you, you teach what, what we're here for. Uh, you, you, you let folks know this is not how a Christian lives. This is how a Christian lives. And we had a great falling away after the Jesus movement those first couple of years because we started 
we started having saying, well, if you're, if you're following Jesus, you shouldn't be living with that girl. If you're following Jesus, you, sh you, you don't need to keep getting strung out on drugs. You don't need to steal. So we, we, we just taught from the scripture. We loved, uh, but we taught. And so the teachers rose up right after the evangelists of the Jesus movement happened. The next wave was teachers and they began to teach from the scripture and it's very, very helpful. And I still have reams of notebooks with my notes from those days. And then, and then it seems like the prophetic began to rise up I mean, started casting a vision as a church. We need to be a prophetic sign for where we live. And that prophetic sign will, will be a contrast with what uh, the enemy, how he wants us to live. So we realized way back then that, that what we showed was a lot more important sometimes than, than what we talked about. So uh, we talked about accountability. We talked about having a friend uh, that you can talk to. Uh, we, we said... Let's live for Jesus 24-7 and not just on weekends. So we, we said all those things that, that pastors say. And there are times that we had wolves come in and we had, and we had to call them up and shoot them, you know. And, uh, and Figuratively. So, yeah. Yes. In love, of course. But we, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think although I look really calm, and my exterior, you know, like that duck on a pond, my little legs are just going like that as I go. I, I was uh, uh, strong in sports and always a leader and all those things. And so I had a, I, I told things uh, with honesty and I was authentic with people. And I just said, you can't do that. You just can't, it's gonna destroy you. So we had those conversations. And there are those that would, like the enemy will send in the wheat, I mean, send in the tares to be with the wheat. And there were those that would come in to try to divide and destroy. And so you, have, you had to deal with it. But I always, I always tried to give them a prophetic declaration. God has a higher destiny for you. Don't you want it? Right. You know. Right. So transitioning into that, because at some point in your pastoral ministry, you began to recognize that there was a prophetic gifting in your life, a calling. And how did you, how did you go from being a hippie that got saved to pastoring a university church to shifting into doing prophetic ministry? How did, you, how did that transition take place? And when did that happen? Well, um, I had a word from the Lord that, that I should follow the favor so wherever I found favor, I would just try to do that. So it, the pa pastoring our church had favor all along. You know, difficulties and challenges, there's always favor. And then these songs started taking a life of their own and invitations to other nations came and, and uh, churches that rejected us in our city at first, suddenly their kids were demanding that they have us in. So we, so we started just going where the favor was and, and we would just be doing what we do, you know, singing, teaching, sharing the gospel. Then in the middle of a song, I would just start to sing something spontaneous, prophetic singing. a prophetic singing. And then I started having words for people uh, and I would just, without thinking, fortunately, sometimes you think too much, but without, I would just say, you know, when I was singing that song, that guy in the blue Adidas shirt, I just felt this about you. And then I would just say, this is it. And, and I didn't even know what to call it, really. And then I got hooked up with a mentor that was in the Latter Rain movement. And he, uh, I, I, I went with him for three years on the free weekends that I had. And he taught me about the prophetic and imparted the gift that was on him into me. And, and from that point on, I grew in confidence. And, and the thing that really saved me as, a, as an individual is we were all about team. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was about singing groups. It wasn't about solos. Everything was team. Everything was groups. And so I had, the Lord had given me a team of men that I still walk with today. Um, and so I could be gone and the level of preaching and teaching wouldn't go down and because we were hearing the same things together. So I really relied on my team. I had to. And then the team grew uh, 
their, their stature, their measure grew when I was away. So um, I think team uh, was one of the best things that I did to pastor that movement and begin to prophesy at the same time. Who, who trained you? Uh, who was the guy that uh, you've told me about him before, kind of took you under his wing and began to develop and kind of mentor that prophetic gifting on the inside of you? His name was Laddie McDonough, and I would uh, go and lead worship for him, and he would prophesy, and I would lead worship. And gradually, he just called me out more and more and saying, you're going you're gonna to stand with me and prophesy tonight. And I look like a deer in the headlights. And, but he, he would push me out there. And that's what mentors do. They push you beyond what you think you can do. And then uh, Laddie had like a seventh grade education and uh, he was great at prophesying, not so good at teaching. And so I thought, I don't want to be one of those guys that it's all about e e emotion, but I want it all to be grounded in scripture. So I asked the Lord to send me another mentor, not to replace Laddie. So I met a guy named Graham Perrins that was from Wales. He went to London Bible School. And he had discovered the prophetic and saw me at a conference in Minnesota, invited me over for three months. And, 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 he, and he's one of the best Bible teachers to this day I've ever met. And so four days a week, we studied the Bible about the prophetic. And then two days, we would go out in what he called a lab. We'd go from church to church and we'd prophesy over people. And he, he's the one that gave me the definition of prophecy, that prophecy is a living word from a living God to a living people. So I had both the word and the spirit in my mentors. That was very helpful. So the, the show them your legal pad. This has become like, uh, this is kingdom currency right here. That's like, you don't want the green paper, you want the yellow paper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because one of the things that I love about uh, Wayne when I've ministered with him is he writes down the words as God gives them prophetic words, words and seasons or for individuals, he writes them down. And then when he gives it to you, he delivers the paper to you so you have it. And I've got a couple of them uh, that I hold dear. And uh, Jane, uh, a couple years ago, uh, <laughs> she told my breakdancing story so I can tell this story. Uh, she, uh, Wayne came and was ministering prophetically here at the church. And he had a word for Jane and I together. So we stood up and it was a word. It was primarily for me, but together. And we got in the car and Jane was so mad. She was just like, I never get a word. <laughs> and I said, well, babe, I said, he can only give what he gets. And she's like, well, I'm never going to get a word. I said, nope, you're never going to get a word with that attitude. And, uh, <laughs> which, by the way, husbands, that did not go well. Uh, but we prayed. I, I just kind of prayed to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, it was a prayer of desperation. Please give my wife a word. <laughs> And that night, uh, I think it was that evening, we came back and he had Jane stand up and he gave her that word. And that, that getting that yellow, because that was her thing, I want a yellow piece of paper. <laughs> she, I don't want just a word from anybody, I want a yellow piece of paper. And so she got that. And that's when my wife fell in love with you, by the way. She's wow. like, that, uh, I love Wayne. And uh, I have traveled with you and seen how people respond to receiving uh, a, a yellow piece of paper, the legal pad. Tell everybody, where did that come from? And uh, why did you decide to do that? Because sometimes if you've come from more of a maybe Pentecostal background, you know, prophecy can be, you know, it can take a lot of different forms. You give it in such just kind of a, a very matter of fact, very calm, very supernaturally natural way. Uh, and it's documented. So talk about that a little bit. Well, I had the yellow pads because I was a business major. And back in the day, we didn't have computers and this is what we used. And, and uh, I started going and hearing people prophesy over other people. And people would say, you said this over me and it wasn't true. And then the prophet would say, I never said that. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, no, I didn't. And so that would go back and forth. And I just thought, Lord, this is this is not good for the prophetic ministry. And, and people aren't owning up when they when they mess up. And I said, what, what do you want me to do? And, and the Lord just said, I want you to write it down. And I want you to give it to him because Thessalonians says that a prophetic word should be examined carefully to see if it's of God or not. And so I didn't want there to be any uh, confusion about what I said. And people will hear things in the emotion of the moment that you didn't say. 
And sometimes, and, and, and so it goes both ways. And so I didn't want to do that because it takes a lot of extra time. And, and just seem, they seem so much more spiritual than me to just walk up like a Robert Morris and just begin to prophesy off the cuff. And, and, and that's what I had done before. But, and the Lord said, I'll use these as seeds of investment. And one day there'll be a great return. And so now, one of the best stories I, I know about this is I was uh, about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, I, I prophesied over this woman in Scotland. And she was very skeptical and uh, just kind of didn't give anything. Just kind of looked at me, we'll see. And so <laughs> 10 years later, I go back to Scotland and this girl shows up, this lady shows up with this crumpled yellow pad and she had had a red pen and there was 10 points or, or eight points or something. And when they happened, she would check them off. And so she came up and she said, just last week, this last one I checked off, it came true. So I can say this is a true prophecy. <laughs> so I am so thankful that I'd had that piece of paper. I wasn't so thankful for her, to be honest. I mean, you know, <laughs> being judged for 10 years and... <laughs> So, but, but that's, and I've even, to be honest, I've asked the Lord to release me from it because it just gets, you know, it takes a lot of time. And, but now I'm seeing these seeds that are just bringing back this return of changed lives. And our, our young people have little yellow pads on their, on their social devices, on their phones. I say, look, pastor, I've got a yellow pad. And, and then there's a bunch of ladies that have pink pads. And so... And every once in a while when I'm doing trainings is I give out five by seven. I call them starter kits. These, this is eight by 10. So it's taken on a life of its own. And I don't, and I don't, if God can use it, I'm all about it. So you and you and Tom Lane wrote a book a couple years ago called He Still Speaks, yep. uh, which by the way, if you've not read that book and you want a book that is uh, really uh, attainable, but just incredible, incredible, rich revelation on the gift of New Testament prophecy. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. It's called He Still Speaks. Uh, and what I love about the book is because you talk about the purpose of the gift of prophecy, how, you know, we sometimes have misconceptions uh, in our mind about what a prophet is or what the gift of prophecy is. People are afraid of it sometimes because you're going to call them out and expose them and embarrass them or condemn them and judge them. And uh, so that was the first thing I, I think that that book does so well. The second part of that book is, in essence, that everybody can prophesy, that God wants everybody to be able to prophesy. Can you just kind of break those two things down, just talk about them and kind of set the stage a little bit? Um, well, there's different, there's different spheres of influence of prophecy. There's that everybody can prophesy when there is a spirit, when there's an anointing to prophesy in a room. We have little kids prophesying at home. They'll come in, there's an anointing in the room and people just start prophesying and, and we try to pastor it and try not to let it go goofy, but we would rather our kids and our people try and fall on their face rather than just lean back so far they fall on their backside. So, and, but then there's the gift of prophecy, which the Holy Spirit decides who gets that gift and that's people that, that uh, prophesy more regularly. There seems to be uh, a more consistent anointing. And then there's, the, the, uh, there's prophets. And that's, that Ephesians 4 talks about those with that gift. They also don't only prophesy, but they equip uh, others to prophesy. And so there's different spheres of the prophetic ministry. Uh, but I believe with all my heart that prophecy is just about hearing from God and saying what he's saying. And so I think, I think the Bible says clearly in 1 Corinthians 14, eagerly desire all spiritual gifts, but especially the gift of prophecy. People are afraid of prophecy a lot of times because they have an Old Testament filter that it's about judgment. It's about law that you're going to get called out and all your sins are going to get exposed. Jesus changed everything. He fulfilled the law. He ushered in grace. And he, through Paul, he defined in 1 Corinthians 14 that prophecy is no longer about judgment and, and law. It's about three things, edification, exhortation, and comfort. 
So prophetic words through the grace filter that Jesus ushered in. Uh, there's some wiggle room in exhortation. Uh, that you, you know, Sometimes I've gotten an exhortation that was a little bit corrective, but it's never about judgment in a wrong way of pushing people down. It's always about calling people higher. So if you look at it, and we tried to do that in the book. We looked at it from a New Testament filter, acknowledging what happened in the Old Testament. Uh, so we think Jesus changed everything. So tonight, uh, we're going to unleash that a little bit in the middle of our worship night. And uh, you get to pass out some yellow paper. Yep. So some, you, you want to be here for that. If you get a yellow piece of paper, you'll want to name it, frame it, and claim it. <laughs> uh, get everything you can. Uh, real quick, before we're done, can you just share maybe, not for your own uh, not for your, your own glory. I know, I know you would never do that, but I think it encourages us when we hear testimonies of how God has used us uh, in different ways, especially prophetic. What's, what's been one of the most dramatic moments of giving a prophetic word, miraculous or you know, impactful prophetic moments that you and all of the years that you've given? Well, I think it could have been when I was pastoring our church and... Uh, a lady walked in the back of the room after the meeting had started and she just stood back there in the back and I just kept being drawn to her and the Lord said, uh, I want you to prophesy over her. So I got this inner dialogue, well, Lord, I'm in the middle of my message and can I just wait? And he said, no, do it now. So uh, I just said, ma'am, I, I don't know you. I don't, this, is this the first time in our church? And she nodded yes. And I said, well, I've got a word. It's a prophetic word, and I don't understand it, but maybe you will. And I said, uh, I hear the Lord saying, what you had planned to do was not, is not God. He doesn't want you to do what you've been planning on doing. And she sort of collapsed, and one, uh, one, of, our, uh, uh, one of our leaders talked to her and eventually brought her down front. And she... Uh, a few days before that, she had found out that her, her daughter had walked away from the Lord and embraced a, a really bad lifestyle. Her husband left her. She had nothing. She wrote out uh, where all the things were, her, her papers and everything for her daughter. And she was going to drive her car down the boat ramp into the Arkansas River and kill herself. And on the way past our church building, something compelled her to pull in. And she pulled in the parking lot, parked, and she heard a voice for the first time. He said, uh, go in there. I wanna, there's a man in there that, that I've got a word for you. So she comes in the door. I speak that word. Um, last time I heard from her about five years ago, she was a Sunday school teacher. Had remarried. Her prodigal had come back to the Lord. And she could have been a statistic. She could have been dead today because she was a very abused woman. So that was one of the most, you know, that was one of the words that I think more deeply impacted me to not hold back when God gives a word. Man, that's beautiful. Well, Pastor Wayne, would you, uh, here's what I want to do. Would you take a few minutes and, and maybe we can all stand up. Let's, uh, let's stretch out a little bit. What I was thinking, uh, have you do is there's such power in impartation and have a lot of leaders. Uh, nobody would come to a, a conference on a Monday and spend all day if they weren't serious about the things of the kingdom. And I know that one of the, your story is a great example of that. One of the things that we need more of in the body of Christ is a greater anointing and a greater boldness and confidence to step out into these type of things whether it's witnessing, whether it's sharing our faith, or whether it's giving somebody a word, it's praying for healing, uh, any of those types of things. I would love it if you would take a few moments and just pray an impartation and an activation in, in us. You know, we all, if you're a believer, you, you all have been given the right to transfer or impart the gifts that you've been given. That's what impartation means. It means transfer. So I couldn't impart to you a gift of bricklaying because you would be terrible. But I can impart to you things I've been given. 
So uh, I'll often pray a prayer of impartation about the prophetic. And usually that encompasses creative people and uh, uh, songwriters, musicians who are often prophetic, but also the pastoral gift. Uh, I think the pastoral gift has become something maybe other than a shepherd. It's become the American equivalent of a CEO often. Let me tell you, you have a pastor that loves you, prays for you. He's a good shepherd. And that's the kind of impartation I'd want to give is that of, of shepherds and shepherdesses and not just a position. All right, is that clear? All right, if you're here and you, and, and you want me to pray this prayer of impartation, would you just put your hand on your heart? That way I know who I'm praying for. And I'm going to pray, I'm going to speak several of these gifts into you that I believe God has, has given me. And so I'll just do that now. Lord Jesus, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to multiply uh, the gifts. Lord, I just feel so privileged to stand here this morning and in, or this afternoon and impart some of those things you've given me. And I believe with all my heart they'll do greater things than I've ever done. So I call out those with a prophetic gift. In the name of Jesus, I impart a spirit of prophecy, a gift of prophecy, the office of the prophet, wherever they are uh, in their sphere of influence. And Father, I pray that they would, they would know something has shifted because they won't fear people's faces anymore. They will have confidence. When you give them a word, they'll give it. And they'll give it in the context of love, not in judgment. So Father, I just come in the name of Jesus and I pray a prayer of impartation. I transfer those things in me that are prophetic into these that are eagerly desiring spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And now, Father, I just want to speak to those shepherds, those pastors, those men and women that are called to love the saints, loving them enough to speak the truth, to bring correction as well as encouragement. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I am part I impart that shepherding gift, that pastoral unction that's in people, that we can care for one another deeply from the heart, not just as a job, not just as a vocation, but as a lifestyle. So, Father, I, I, I speak an extra measure of grace for those shepherds. It's, a lot of it is unseen, and they carry a lot of burdens they don't need to carry. So I just ask you, great shepherd to come and teach them how to be shepherds. And then, Father, I want to impart to those creatives, those songwriters, those singers, those musicians, those actors, those potters, those poets, uh, those dancers, wherever they are using the creative arts for your glory. Lord, I impart a prophetic element into their gift that their songs would be living their poetry and their pottery would speak of the kingdom of God and not just of the artist. I pray that the dancers would rise up again and usher in joy. Lord, we need the dancers to rise up again and usher in joy. Lord, I pray there'd be a prophetic element, a sensing and a timing, when to release a song, when to do a dance, when to unveil a painting. And Father, I pray that you would open up what you've invested in this church and it would run across the world through many of these creatives, these prophets, these pastors and shepherds that you're raising up in this room. I impart these gifts in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wayne. Let's give it up.